Welcome to the Loki Podcast with John Ball from Present Influence. We use Buzzsprout to upload and distribute the Loki Podcast to all major podcasting networks. If you're thinking of starting your own podcast, check out the link to Buzzsprout in the show notes. You could start your podcast today. Today on the show, I am very excited to, to, to introduce to you a guest who I've been very much looking forward to speaking to. Elizabeth Backman is the go-to person for advanced level training in speaking, presentation skills, sales and leadership with a lifetime spent perfecting the art of presenting. And she helps high level clients master a message that brings the funding they need, the allies that they want and the recognition that they deserve. Now, I think we can all agree that is somebody worth talking to. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, John. This is so much fun. I'm really happy to have you with me, and and mainly because you have such an interesting background as well. And what you're doing now is amazing, but your experience and background is quite unique in in some ways. I've certainly never spoken to somebody with that, and I'm not going to steal your thunder, but let you tell us a bit about your experience and background. Well, uh, I like to think that I was dedicated to the art of great communication since I first walked on stage at the age of five. And my mom said I was the best goddamn bunny rabbit that ever graced the stage of the hillside school. And I was hooked. Like, you're five. Your mom says you're wonderful. Great. So I was going to be a famous actress on Broadway. That was the plan until I went off to college and realized that there were a whole lot of other people who were a lot better than I was. Right. What I was really good at was directing. Uh, I am an oldest child, so uh, I'm a little bossy. I've been been accused of being a little, uh, uh, telling people what to do all the time anyway. And I moved into directing and then directing opera singers. I grew up listening to the opera. My parents loved opera. My grandmother spoke eight languages, basically because she was a scholar and she liked languages. And so I had a parallel interest in language and got a degree in French and theater and and then went straight to work in professional theater and found myself in opera, uh, working my way up through the ranks and until I was directing at the Metropolitan Opera and around the world. So I've directed people like Luciano Pavarotti and Placido Domingo and many, many others. And so, and I learned so much from that. And then the business part came in when I was invited to start a small opera company in the Austrian Alps. And what we, what we did was trained young singers and produced events for the tourists in this resort area in the Alps in the state of Tyrol. So it was the Tyrol Open Program, Tyrolean Opera Program, TOP for short, and 11 years of that taught me a whole lot about business. And I started teaching presentation skills. I learned about presentation skills, actually, because it was a nonprofit organization, Top Opera. I had to create a nonprofit in the U.S., and I had to raise $100,000 to launch it, okay. even if I had five people to start off with. I, I sure didn't have that in my bank account. Yeah. I had to do it by giving speeches. And this, uh, I was giving speeches. It was the first time in a lifetime of standing up and performing that I actually had to deliver a result, that I had to get people to open their wallets. And learning how to do that was, uh, uh, well, at first I was terrified and terrible. I was pretty bad. <laughs> And what really saved me was someone who was a presentation skills trainer who liked music came to one of my one of my fundraisers and said, called me up the next morning and she said, you know, there's some things you could do. There is this art form called public speaking presentation skills. And I said, you mean there are tools? <laughs> there are techniques? Because <laughs> oh, I was just inventing it as I went along. Yeah. And and I'll never forget the first time I, I asked somebody, uh, a wealthy patron of the arts, if she would 
make a donation to sponsor this idea I had. I hadn't even done it yet. I had no results to show. I just had a dream and told her about it. And I used the techniques that I had learned. And instead of just giving me the hundred dollars that I was expecting, she wrote a check for 3000. She wow. said that full scholarship for some deserving singer. I believe you can do this. And that, that, that just blew my mind. So yeah. I learned how to fund my nonprofit. The more I started working with presentation skills, and I started also training business people on that. And the more I did that, the more interested I got. Yeah. And I now, uh, after 30 years, I've, opera was wonderful, but I'm not doing it anymore. I'm really focusing, focusing mostly full-time on business, business skills and helping presenters, whether within a company or whether you're speaking to promote your company or to make a sale, or if you're trying to sell an idea inside a meeting right. and inspire your team, That's all good. aspects of presentation skills. Yeah. And I know that you are a, a presentation skills trainer as well. So yes. I, I know when our first conversation, we got to, uh, we got to geek out a little bit about <laughs> the techniques you can use. Oh, there's so much. That's an endless conversation, that one. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, but you got, uh, I mean, listen to your story there. And there's some things that we didn't you know, have time to chat about before when, when we spoke about putting an episode together. But I, I'm really interested that you started your public speaking, I guess, without any training. Like, and, and I do think that a lot of people have this almost expectation that people who are good at public speaking just suddenly get up on the stage and, and they're amazing at it. So there's uh, <laughs> this expectation to do that. And, and yet there's really very few people who have that sort of natural ability to be able to just get up on the stage and, and talk and keep talking and, and, and rapture an audience. It, it does does take a bit of time. But um, that, that was interesting. How did you feel when, when you first realized you were going to have to give a, a, a talk? Well, I believe, I'm going to answer the question behind your question first. I believe that anybody can learn to be a great public speaker, a great presenter, if you will. It just takes practice. The thing is that the people you see who just get up and they do it, it looks as if they're, you know, they're spontaneous at a party or whatever. They look like they've, they've done it. What we don't see is the hours and hours of practice they have put they've put in at home in their bedroom trying to practice it. And entertainment skills or skills to be noticed, to be recognized, many people learn that in childhood. Sometimes it's a survival trait. So you sometimes in order to survive at school, you're the funny kid. And yeah. and so I do believe it is learned behavior. I was used to telling stories because as an opera director, you know, 30 years of that and, and 20 years before that of acting, I was used to telling stories and shaping a story. So making a speech for which you need to get a result is a matter of shaping what you're going to say so that you use actual story stories, but also the whole thing is a story. And it's one of the things I learned from, from all those years in the opera is that there's the arc of the story, the arc of the experience and how you do that. Mm. So the cool part about presentation skills is it's a learnable skill it's like yes. anything else you just have to learn how to do it and I don't know I do remember how terrified I was when I was first learning how to drive and uh and the old retired police sergeant who taught me um my parents figured out pretty fast pretty fast that it was not a good idea for them to try to teach me to drive and so I uh, they there was a retired sergeant in the police and he would sit there and sit with me and help me. And how hard it was to memorize, learn all those things that you have to know as a driver 
and then it becomes automatic. Right. And it's the same sort of thing with any skill. The more you study it, the more you work on it, the more it becomes automatic. Yeah. I think that there is this uh, assumption, I've talked about it a few times on, on, on some episodes, but there is an assumption that uh, you, you're supposed to have some natural ability at it or that you need to have a natural ability to be any good at it. And, and you're absolutely right, you don't. Uh, it is something that you can get better at. But I do think there is, there is, for some people, maybe something that sometimes stops them from, from doing that. Not just fear, but maybe just uh, sometimes, I, I would maybe put it as a, an unwillingness to completely just let go and, and have at it and uh, you know, throw themselves into, into a greater deal of flexibility. And maybe that's a bit further along in the conversation than, we, than, than we're done about. But, but it's something I... I tend to see uh, because I, I spend a lot of time evaluating speakers and, and seeing mm-hmm. what makes the difference between someone who who is good and, and someone who just has the potential to be good. What do you think? Yeah, it it does take practice. After all, nobody plays Hamlet the first time they pick up the script. You've got to, you've got to practice it. Another thing that people forget is that speaking is a physical act. You do actually have to train your lips and tongue to to pronounce the words. Um, You can imagine how long it took me to be able to say international opera director and presentation skills trainer. Uh, I I really had to practice to say that in flow off my tongue, but I've now said it so many times that I've done that. So it is it is a skill that takes practice and in my book, the, the people that I work with are speaking not to just get up and speak. They're speaking to move people to take action. Therefore, it's a tool. And it's just like learning any tool. You've got you've to master it. You've got to learn how to do it. What, I'm, what breaks my heart is to see people who go out and they do kind of a half-baked job. They're just sort of, they, it's okay. If okay is good enough, I'll just get out there and do it. I find the difference is what's at stake. So I tend to work with people who are, uh, I'm working with people who need, need to get a result and they're not being heard, often with women, often with women in male-dominated industries. Mm-hmm. Um, opera director, I was one of the early women. I wasn't the first wave of the ones who were saying, oh, how weird, there's a woman directing. Uh, Fortunately, I wasn't that, but I was in the second wave of people who, women who still had to prove themselves. It was accepted and politically correct to have a woman directing, But people still sort of looked at you out of the corner of their eye to say, hmm, can you do this? And God forbid, if you have a female conductor too, then the local newspaper would would call up and say, okay, so you have a woman director and a woman conductor. This different. And we'll say, well, we bring different insights. So I do a lot with corporate women who aren't being heard. Women, usually high-level senior directors and so forth, who are not who who are bumping into the glass ceiling of not being able to get to to vice president. Because for a lot of things, you get to be senior director or senior manager through uh, you get to be, and then the next step into the vice president, the C-suite, if you will means positioning yourself in a different way. So a great deal of my work is helping women position themselves, navigate the jungle of getting rising in a corporate culture without being accused of being brash and bossy. And, and you know, there are things that men can get away with and women cannot because socialized to expect different things from men and women. So yeah. a lot of it is also the gender communication. I do a lot, a lot of work with people about that. And one of the reasons why I do that is because I have made all the mistakes myself. 
<laughs> it's like it's like I pretty much made all those mistakes and fallen on my face over and over, and people helped me, and so a lot of that is passing that on. Yeah, that, that's super important, and and it's great to see. You know, see more and more that uh, there's more women coming up in positions where I'm just happy to see them and, and leading in ways that are new and innovative and, and really getting some amazing results as well. And and I'm, I, for one, I'm happy to see it. And, and I know that there, there could be many reasons why people maybe hold themselves back and we're all maybe too willing to put people into a box as soon as we can. And we, we mm-hmm. like to categorize people very quickly. And so then we, we assign attributes to them. And like, well, if you're this, you're this kind of person. Or if you're this, should I be paying you attention or not? No matter how progressive you might intend to be, uh, we can't ever fully escape the uh, conditioning, uh, not just from family, but from media and society in general that we've grown up with. It's still hanging around there in our psyches uh, and there's, uh, there's still work to be done. But I do think you know, things are getting better and better and there are more young women and young people growing up without those kinds of attitudes and experiences, thankfully. Uh, you must see this because you're a Brit living in Spain and <laughs> yeah. an American going back and forth between the U.S. and Austria. So I'm in uh, every three months of not during a pandemic, but normally I s- spend half the year in my home in Austria where where we did the uh, we have a home there, which is why I was invited to do an opera company there. But um, in the state of Tyrol and just watching the way that people communicate and the assumptions that people make hopefully makes us notice those assumptions about ourselves. The other thing that I find is really interesting, uh, being a, a word nut and loving words, is how different languages teach us different things. Um, I just... Uh, Yesterday, I was supposed to sit in on a, a conference in Austria, and then I had a big, I had a big project land in my lap, and said, and so I sent them a message saying, um, "I have a reason project die in meinem Schoß gelandet ist," and in just the direct translation. And I wonder if they actually, if the Germans actually say, or the Austrians actually say, "A project lands in my lap." Or is that an English phrase? I, right, it, it may well be. Idiomatic language is a tough one to navigate in any when you're speaking any foreign language, for sure. And since there are, uh, I find in Spanish there are some idioms that, that translate and some that just don't. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I have that experience in conversation with my husband sometimes. You know, so uh, some, sometimes he has to ask me what an expression means or, or what what it is what it is I'm saying because I don't always realize that what I'm saying is idiomatic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the, here's the other thing. As a speaker, this is really important to recognize, especially since we are more and more in an international business environment. So I'm doing a program for a group in Innsbruck, Austria. That's Innsbruck is the town. We're between Innsbruck and Munich. So uh, no Innsbruck is a group beautiful. of uh, I'm I'm putting together a program for Austrians who want to work in the U.S., and what they should know about how to show up, how to how to present themselves, and what the expectations are, especially if you're if you're um, interviewing for a job with an American company. But you might be say, and mostly it's in tech nowadays. Uh, I work work in Silicon Valley a lot, so if you are if you're doing an interview in English, which is not your first language, and you are trying to get a job, trying to convince somebody in the company to hire you, English might not be their first language either. Or they, you know, they, the person who's doing the hiring isn't necessarily an American. It might be, or their parents might have come in from India, or they might be Korean, or they might be Spanish or German or Mexican. And this, it's such an international world these days that uh, I go back to speaking being a physical act 
and your lips and tongue, you have to train them. You also have to train yourself to be clear, to choose, to choose your, um, your phrases. So, so before I'm going to use something like a project landed in my lap for an Austrian or German audience, I'm going to ask, I said, is this something that you say? Right. Otherwise, I will figure out what the phrase is auf Deutsch and, and then say it in English, a phrase, something that they will understand implicitly, implicitly, which brings me to the thing that I always say is rule number one, which is it's all about them. Who's listening and what do they need to hear? especially if you're trying to move people to take action. If, you're, if you need to get a result, my, my company is called Strategic Speaking for Results because we always start with what's the result you want to get, who's listening, and how do you need to present it in a way that they will get it? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Start with the end in mind. Exactly. It's, it's super important. Backwards. I'm, I, this is maybe a personal interest, but I, I think it's going to be interesting to everybody, hopefully. Um, that one thing I'm, I'm curious about is that putting on an opera is a big production. That's what I was going on mm-hmm. speaking just for a second, but not too far away. Um, what, and based on this, I'm assuming you have similar principles that you have an outcome for what you're going to deliver there and you're focused on the result. What are, what would have been the main sort of things in your in your focus as you start to put together your vision of what that's going to look like and, and how you're going to deliver that for for something like an opera? It's it's different for everybody. As the director, my job is to figure out what's the approach to the story. So now, there are no new stories out there. I do believe. Everything is, you know, it might be boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. Right. Or, uh, you know, or you go off into the woods, something magical happens, everything gets changed, and then you come back to society. Or even like a TV show, you know, somebody gets murdered, the detective has to go and figure out who it is, and they'll have a couple of false false starts and then it will all be resolved five minutes before the end and then the last five minutes will be an epilogue that ties up all the stories so i do believe that there are only about 10 stories in the world as a director what i have to say is what's my vision for this Uh, and uh, and what's my vision for this? And how can I be true to the music? For me, this wasn't popular for many years, but for me, it's all dictated by the music. And so if the composer has given us a great wrenching chord somewhere, there has to be a reason for it. Why does that happen? And coming from that point of view, with that, with an opera, I'm going to start with what's the story and how do I want to st- tell the story. I will also, however, keep in mind where I am, where I'm going to be, you know, what kind of, who's the audience and where are they from, so that I know if my take on this story will play well there. Um, there's a famous story of the Metropolitan Opera was doing a new production of, I don't know, I think it was Tosca or something else. And the set designer came up with um, fascist, Naziist, uh, the picture of the, the buildings were just what the Nazis did in World War II. Mm. Well, this was playing in New York City, which is full of people whose parents and grandparents escaped, you know, were Jews who escaped from the Holocaust. And they had to say, you you cannot, we will not build this because our audience will not come to something that brings up those horrible memories. 
at this the sort of thing that you have to you have to think of what's going to make sense some things are universal and i don't even remember where we started on this i get all passionate about it <laughs> yeah the vision the vision and how you bring yeah. love actually and it's also starting at the end there are there are moments where you know this moment is going to happen so how do i work backwards to set it up so that it is the next, it is the logical thing to happen musically and dramatically. In Madama Butterfly, for instance, here's where I think about this and, and I, I think is the, the woman's take on it. Madama Butterfly, for those who don't know, is about a geisha, a Japanese geisha, who uh, is purchased by an American sailor, American lieutenant, who, who falls in love with her, falls in lust with her, and buys her for, uh, for the amount of time that he's in Nagasaki. And then, and they have a wonderful love duet at the end of the first act, and then he goes away. And acts two and three are three years later, she's got a little baby, a little half-breed baby, and she is clinging to the thought that he's coming back, he's coming back. Mm. And at the end, he comes back with his an American wife, and she kills herself so the child can go off and have a life in America. And this was written by 19th century man with the image of a woman as the pure self-sacrificing butterfly suicide is a pure self-sacrifice to save her child. And as a modern woman, I had a hard time believing that. It just didn't feel real. I couldn't see myself doing that. And because I started as an actor at age five, I have to figure out in my head what makes it make sense. Uh, I finally came to terms with it if I thought of this as... Butterfly the geisha has decided, she hates her old life. She hates being Japanese. She's decided to become American. She waits for three years. He's going to come back someday. He's going to come back someday because the alternative would be to believe that she had just been rented as, you know, rented like a prostitute. She didn't want to do that. She wanted the status of being an American wife. When she's faced with the fact that she's been living a lie all this time and that he'd forgotten her, married somebody else, she has, she has completely lost her honor. And that, for me, would be that shame and guilt and rage and despair. That would be enough to say, Life will be better if the world will be better if I'm not here. And therefore, the only honorable thing I can do is commit suicide. And I find there are a lot of people who really reject that. Mm. For me, that was what made it possible to play, to direct the show in a way that Butterfly was a real person and not an image in some 19th century man's mind of the perfect self-sacrificing wife. Yeah, more of a stereotype or archetype otherwise. Yeah, an archetype. But to play it, to perform it, and for me to direct it, to make it real, I had to believe it. So that was starting from the end and working backwards and then figuring out where I could put clues in and what things I could notice or say that would set that up the audience might not notice but the actors will mm. and that was what was important for that my main audience was the cast for them to believe it right so that the woman who's singing butterfly can do the harakiri she can cut her she can cut her throat with the sword in a way that will that she will believe it. And if she, the performer, the presenter, if you will, if the presenter believes it and can convince the audience that she believes it and it makes it real, 
then the audience will understand that. They may not understand it on a conscious level, but they'll understand it on an unconscious level. Yeah. So we're talking about that. I actually, it makes me think that um, thinking about the unconscious, what you unconsciously project, doing that with presenters now is just an outgrowth of what I did all those years at the opera. It's, it's not just the surface. It's what's below the surface as well. So you're seeing and some new parallels the there. Yeah, that's great. Sorry, what? You're seeing like a new, uh, seeing a new parallel be- between what you did then and what you do now. Yeah, it, it really training presenters was a natural outgrowth of training singers. Right. It's just and because the skills you need to sell a song are pretty much the same skills you need to sell a product or a service or an idea. The difference is just vocabulary, and I speak five languages, so I understand about vocabulary. Yeah. So you can get some get some ideas that I'm already seeing some um, parallels between opera and public speaking, which which I never would have even thought about before before speaking to you, which is fascinating. What then do you see as um, maybe being some of the more um, more direct parallels between opera performance and directing and public speaking? Well, again, you are. You have to be true to yourself. That's the big thing. Again, if there are only about 10 stories, if you are doing, say, a a sales conversation, it is a sales conversation, that uh, if you're speaking to get a result, you're you're convincing people to to do what you want them to do, that's a sales conversation. A lot of people don't like the word sales, but I think of it as an enrollment conversation. We talk to help people enroll them into going along with your idea. As a singer, you are doing a performance either to get hired, you're doing an audition, so what you want them to do is hire you. When you're on stage after you've been hired, you want to make the audience cry or your or the result you want or to laugh, which is harder. In order to do that, you have to work backwards and figure out how, what is it that's going to reach this audience? The thing that's that's so enormously helpful in opera is that you've got the story, you've got the words, you've got the music, and anybody who's ever watched uh, a movie or a TV commercial understands the power of music to move our emotions. As a speaker, you usually have to come up with your own script, your own text. I like to break it down into strategy, script, and style. And those are the three things that, the, this, the three buckets that everything falls into. And it, it all melds together. It all works together. But the strategy is who's your audience, who's listening, what do you want them to do, and how do you need to present it in a way that will make them react. The script are the words you use. And that's where uh, trainers like you and I get in, in terms of how you say something, what's the language that you use, and the various enhancements. If you have your basic message, you have your basic message, and then you can spice it up so that you you're, say say you're say you're at a conference and you're saying hire my company. You could just get out there and say hire my company because we do a good job, or you could go out and you could use enhancements like um, embedding embedding an idea, asking questions, ways of phrasing it, the melody of your message, the way you say it, your pace, your tempo. I learned a lot of, I I use a lot of my musical training in terms of helping people the way they they use their voice and even just enunciating. Those are, I have a a list of 17 keys that I use to enhance a script. And I think of it as the basic message is, say, say you're making, say you have an Italian restaurant. And you could just 
boil up some spaghetti and dump a can of tomatoes on it and serve it. And it would be edible, but it would be boring and it's not going to have people beat a path to your door. In order to have, the, to have them beat a path to your door, you have to add spices and different flavors and the way you present it on the plate. That is a metaphor for being a good speaker is the enhancements, the speaker keys that I use to enhance a script or to help a client enhance a script are like the basil and the oregano and maybe the pepperoncini that are going to flavor a pasta sauce so that your Italian restaurant has people beating a path to the door. Great. What, what would be in the similarities of um, coaching and advising uh, and directing uh, an opera singer uh, or to doing that with a person who you're teaching, or helping to, to present them? What, what would be maybe some of the similarities or, or even some of the differences there? It's very similar. It's just, it's just different vocabulary. So uh, for me, speaking is an art form. Uh, I, I actually, the big difference, come to think of it, the big difference is that most of the, that in an opera, the presentation, the performance is an end in itself. That is the product. And so you spend a lot of time, you spend years practicing training your tool, training your, training your body, training your voice, training your skill, honing your skills. And then everybody gets together and they put, and they make, put together a great project and you perform it and then it's done. It's like that, it's that, like that plate of spaghetti, you eat it and it's gone. So you, hopefully everyone's had a wonderful time and then it's done. For the speaking that I do, I that speaking that I do and the speaking that I train people do, it's using presentations, using your speech as a way of gaining visibility. So it's actually a marketing tool, marketing and branding for the women who are hitting a glass ceiling. We help them, I help them make presentations within their company. But I also help them come up with ideas, putting their ideas into speeches that can become an article on LinkedIn, it can be your speech on a webinar, be what you talk about if you're being interviewed, all those things. The good thing is you put it together once and then you can use it over and over and over again. But the end result is to be visible. So that people who overlooked you before or took you for granted before will go, oh, wow, look at her. She had, I didn't realize that she knew all this stuff. Sometimes it's just a, as I have a, my client, uh, Pamina has a, Pamina has a, uh, she's the director of a division for a large retail company. And she's, she's done the, she does cloud services for a large retail company. And they think of her as someone who's got the technical chops, the technical ideas, which is great. But she's also a strategic thinker, and nobody knows that. And so we've added to her general speeches. She says, she says well, I know you invited me to this, to this conference, to speak at this conference because of my technical skills. But really, I am a strategic thinker, and here is the strategy behind it. So the technical skills get her in the door. Yeah. But she actually will say, yes, I have technical skills, but what I'm really interested in is the strategy. I am a thought leader. And you just say, I am a thought leader. And people start saying, oh, Amira, she's a thought leader. Maybe we want to promote her. Yeah. There's, so. there's, a, there's a lot of power in presentations, I think. And there is a, yes. a lot to be said for, I mean, there's almost just a natural state of influence of when you're the person who's on a stage or some kind of platform, it's all eyes on you and you have people's attention. So it's down to you where, where you go with that and what journey you, you take them on. But that is in itself a responsibility, but it is also a, um, a very leverageable source of power and influence with people. And Absolutely. you talked about these strategy style and uh, strategy scripts and style, put it in the right order. And uh, 
what what would you see as being the main points of influence or the main strategies of influence then within a presentation that may maybe make the biggest impact for especially for example some of the people who you work with well then how you print how you do it is the style part you have to figure out what you're saying and who you're saying it to that's strategy and script and then how you present it is the charisma the charisma of it and how do you talk about it in a way that's interesting if you think of it um it the more charismatic you are or funny or interesting the more people will pay attention and they will pay attention on an emotional level so that's why i talk about the melody of your message being part of the style training when i with people they're usually strong in most people have have all three skills it just where are you stronger so some of the people i talk with they're brilliant at writing the script but not so great at speaking it or they know a whole lot about something complicated but when they talk about it they go off on tangents or they go down into the weeds about the fascinating details of soil microbiology and uh where they're trying to get somebody to actually invest in the startup so we talk about how to how to deliver that in a way using the tools that are very similar to the tools you use in music in singing so that you come off charismatic and interesting and you get them interested and excited that's where it's the parallel to moving the audience to tears or moving the audience to laughter i said earlier moving the audience to laughter is much harder anybody who's ever done comedy knows that uh that in order to do comedy you have to rehearse 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 because it's all about timing. Yeah. And all those famous comedians that you see out there on stage what you don't see are the hours they have spent practicing it. Doing doing this piece a little bit later, a little faster, a little slower, maybe we take one word out or we add one more word. Practice 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 practice. Yeah. Just also what makes it fun because speaking is a living art for me. There's a level of musicality even just in speaking. I wonder if you particularly see that and notice that when you're well oh, yeah. as well. Well, that's why I said that the the melody of your message. Yeah. It's the melody and I teach people in English because it is my native tongue. I uh I'm fluent in also in French, Italian, German and pretty good Spanish. although my written spanish is terrible but the rest of it i'm pretty good in but i also i know that i don't know i don't know them at the level of someone who grew up in those languages sure. so my specialty is telling somebody who uh, so where when i work with someone when their first language is not english is helping them phrase it in a way that would make sense to an american if they're speaking to Americans. Uh, I did a speech in I was at a conference in London last year and we had a lot of conversations back and forth between the difference between British English and American English. And a lot of the American speakers, it was a conference for speakers and a lot of the Americans were on their first trip to England. They'd never been to London before. Um I I've, I've been going to London since I was a teenager, so it is things that I was familiar with but people also have the regional accents yes. and all of that it's really um there is a you have to pay attention to that and if you've only ever spoken to people in your own neighborhood you don't realize what it is where i live in austria in the tirol the the tiroler dialect is it's a form of german but it's a very a, a very um all in the back of the throat there's a ach, ach, uh, a friend of mine says the uh, tirolerish isn't a it's not really a a language it's a uh, um it's a disease of the throat because it's all 
back in the back of the throat. So when I'm working with Tyrolians to help them speak, I have to help them move the voice into the front of the, to speak in the front of their mouth, which is something you would never notice unless, you would never notice if it's your native language. Yeah. I'm having uh, flashbacks to uh, my school orchestra trip when I was 16. We did a concert tour of the Tyrol and uh, uh, and in Austria. It was a beautiful place, wonderful, but a long time ago. And uh, but uh, the, it's just been the oh, musical connection with the Tyrol again. But it's kind of a musical place. It's uh, mm-hmm. all associations yeah. there as well. For sure. I guess that's maybe why you got asked to do some opera work there. I, I did warn you I am something of a, of a nut about words. I get all excited about language. Love language. Yeah, me too. Uh, sometimes I, I think sometimes I manage to come up with words that uh, I, I, I pride myself on having a, an expansive vocabulary and uh, sometimes do manage to come up with words that don't get used too often, but uh, just kind of fit i probably won't be able to manage it now that i've just said that today but it is uh, is something that i like to do because i think vocabulary is uh, is a very powerful thing and gives you a lot more uh, a lot more options to express yourself and sometimes i know when i'm writing or composing a, a script or a speech or a, pre- a webinar or whatever i'm doing it's important to have the right words I just recently been doing some learning around the art of storytelling and uh, uh, and how you, you know, really cra- if you're really going to craft a story you have to work with the vocabulary pick the right words have them in the right order get that flow to them quite a beautiful thing when you put it together and, but uh, when you hear it it sounds wonderful but you would have no idea from the outside how much work has gone into that and as we were talking before about the practice 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 but I mean it, the, there's so much crafting that can go into this. Uh, and and the craft, the craft is the fun part. Yeah. And I would bet, John, that when you when you are speaking in English to uh, to a group of Spaniards, where you live, you choose simpler words. You don't use those exciting vocabulary English exciting. You use words that somebody who learned English in school as a as a foreign language would be able to get. Yeah. I, I also try to avoid some of my typical English humor as well, which doesn't always translate so well to Spanish. Oh yeah, humor. Just, yeah. That's a whole different inner yeah. humor in other languages is a whole other thing. Yes. I, I, I love to hear people's stories, Elizabeth, and I and I'm betting you've got some pretty good stories, especially from your, your days in the opera. Are there, are there any that come to mind that you could share with us? Uh well, there was uh, when I was working with Luciano Pavarotti, um, I often tell a story about this client I had who had a big project to do and he was nervous. And he had, we were doing Aida at the Metropolitan Opera and he had never done that production before. So there was no, they had to, they made a new costume for him. He was also a little bit nervous. Um, act three of Aida, there's an extended duet for the soprano and the tenor. And he was worried about his mouth being dry. So he would get some Ricola lozenges and suck on them a little bit till they were sticky. And then he stuck them to the cuff of his, uh, you know, the silk cuff of his costume, which was a big band of gold. And he had, and then he'd be on stage. And when it was her turn to sing, he would turn up stage and sort of put his, put his hand up to his mouth as if he was very moved. But really what he was doing was he was uh, grabbing one of those Ricolas off of his cuff and then sucking on it. He'd turn around and he'd listen. And then it was, when it was his turn to sing, he'd turn up stage again and he'd spit, he'd stick it back onto his sleeve. But the thing is you could see it because he had this big band of gold and he had these brown lumps on it. So I, out and hunted through the drugstore until I found throat lozenges that were yellow. Yes. And I found him, and I came and I brought him some yellow throat lozenges. So because if he was going to do, I wasn't going to be able to stop him doing this. He had convinced himself he needed to do this in order to sing. And this, you know, singing is a very psychological thing. You have to convince yourself you can. So I just 
I said, let's just do this so that we don't see. So um, yellow throat lozenges on a gold cuff. There you go. And it's simple in its elegance as well. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that with us. What, one thing I see that we, we did touch on a little bit when we chatted pre-recording um, was um, there's, I mean, certainly there's a lot of mistakes that people make in, in their presenting, and that's why people like us can, can really help and make a difference. But, um, but also some, sometimes you can start off down the path of becoming a speaker or a presenter or whatever you want to do, and, and just... It, a lot of people always have this idea of if you build it, they will come. Like if you're doing it, you'll get the audiences or you'll get the bookings. And it doesn't always go that way. What do you think are the main reasons? I think you have some some pretty good insights as to why that is for some people. Well, it goes back to rule number one. It's all about them. So it goes back to it. what happens is that we see speakers who are excited about something. And because they're excited, they're assuming everyone else is going to be excited. And so they want to get out there and they want to talk about the glories of um, soil microbiology, for instance. I have a scientist client who helps, has a fabulous startup about soil microbiology, and she can go off on long tangents about the science. The thing is that I listened to her because I liked her and I wanted to know what it was, but what she needed to do is she needed to present this idea to investors who were money people. They weren't, they weren't biologists. So how do you, so her first few speeches were all about how cool the science was and the investors were bored and started checking their emails on their phones and she didn't raise any money. So she didn't get the results she wanted. And that's when she came and hired me. And she said, I, I don't know how I'm going to pay you, but what's my, my first investment? I'm going to give you a chunk of it, was, was, what, we, was what we finally did. She was a friend as well, so I was helping her out. And we figured out how to do just enough of the science that they would, they would understand, that, that the investors would understand why this was important but not so much that that you she buried them in details. And the thing is, I feel is if you have a message, if you want to get out there and tell your story and, and do something that's that's wonderful, if you don't care, if you're just out there to tell your story, then great. Tell your story. Write a book. Uh, if you would just want to entertain wonderful. Go book yourself in an open mic somewhere. Do, do, do things like that. I've got comedian friends who do that. The part that I help people with is when you are speaking to get people to open their wallets, basically, to move them to take action or within a company to speaking to upper management to get them to approve what your team wants to do, things like that. You have to take it into account who's listening. And that is the craft of it. That's what we've been talking about this whole time is the craft. Yeah. Do you, do you think the skills and knowledge that you have now, could, would they have been a gift to you when you started your opera career, do you think? I had to learn them in order to raise the money to, to do it. I, I actually thought, oh, I... I could put this together and, and we'll just do it next year. And no, it actually took me two years to raise the money because I had to learn, I had to learn how to be a business owner from having been an independent contractor. I, you know, I had been, I'd been working on my own for many years, but I'd been a working artist. Right. I had to turn myself into a business owner, a producer, um, American style producer, if you will, but someone who puts the show together and runs it like a business. And that's really where I applied the bits of business that I learned. And one of the, one of the things I learned was that even as a nonprofit, we didn't qualify for any grants. And, and that's another thing is I learned that I couldn't go and make a pitch to a foundation or a donor 
if they didn't care about helping young singers do opera. You know, people will pay for what they're what they're interested in. And so um, I had to learn how to give a speech that inspired an audience enough to say, here's a possibility. You can invest in helping a young person with their dream. And we'd love to have you come visit. But almost nobody ever did because it was, that's the other thing, was that I was raising money in America for something where the results were all in Austria. We did the, the program in Austria and only three or four of our donors ever actually came and saw it happen. Yeah, so I had to learn how to give them, give them a taste of what it was about. Yeah. So um, had I known that before, I would have probably studied it before and I would have probably started an opera company earlier, but yeah. I learned it when I needed it. That was the time that was when true for most so. people, right? I mean, I, I, I say I came to public speaking pretty late in my life, really. And, and like maybe I, I wish I'd discovered it when I was younger because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, uh, much like yourself, I wanted to go into acting, but uh, I, I kind of made the decision that uh, I would have had to spend a lot of time being poor and out of work for, that I wasn't prepared to do. And I also wasn't convinced I was uh, handsome enough or uh, talented enough to make it in acting. But public speaking and presentation work is my outlet, is my, my mm -hmm. performance. Exactly. Uh, and to be honest, you know, it's a, it's a level of performance that I, that I love because it has the flexibility and I get to perform in my own terms as well as, as myself, which at first was terrifying and, and then becomes, uh, then just becomes, I'm not sure I could do it any, any other way now almost, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this is really wonderful stuff and, and I really thank you for what you shared with us today and, and some uh, your stories and your insights. And I, and I definitely want to respect your time. I see we've already been going for, going for a while, and so I don't want to mm -hmm. keep you too, too much longer. However, uh, I do still have a question for you that people, I'm pretty sure some people are going to want to know more about you, especially perhaps uh, women who are hearing your message and thinking, yeah, that's me, I could really do with uh, speaking to somebody like Elizabeth. How should they go about that? And uh, what kind of things would you, would you be able to offer for them? The easiest thing to do is I have a free assessment. It's a, it's a four minute quiz that you can just take just to see where your presentation skills are strong and where you might need a little support. And you can find that at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And that will let you see where you are, what you need help with. And, and then it will connect you with me. And if you're interested, you can then get a conversation with me. I'm on WhatsApp. I'm on Zoom. Um, and we will then start an email contact. I highly recommend it. You're right be at my website, which I'm sure will be in your show notes. With yeah, Elizabeth. all this will be in the show notes, absolutely. And uh, I actively encourage people to to come and connect with you. I think you're wonderful to speak to. And uh, you have uh, what I would consider some very unique insights into into an industry of, of speaking, presenting, and, and uh and that's what it's all about, the unique insights, seeing what other people don't sometimes and being able to help people in the particular ways where you understand the performance nature, you understand the structure, the, 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 you said the strategy, the script and the style. Those are such important elements for people to really get a grasp of here. One, a few things before, just before we close up for today. If somebody is uh, interested in opera and they've never listened to an opera before, where should they start? I would start with Carmen. Carmen or La Boheme. Those are two great ones to start with. And definitely you can listen to it. Listen, to, It helps to listen to the, uh, the highlights, but then watch it. And you can do that. You can watch that on YouTube or anywhere. If you have an opera company near you, once we start doing live opera again, go live because there is nothing like the experience of hearing it live and those singers who are on stage with no microphones making that incredible sound. It's uh, it, it's really, it's just storytelling with music. Yeah. And, and 
the ones I've seen are visually stunning as well. It's a real a real feast for the mm-hmm. sense. So it's a, definitely a good thing to do and recommend. Thank you for those recommendations. I'm, I'm a big believer in lifelong learning. What is a, a book or a resource that you've come across recently or at any time really that you would recommend to other people? Uh, I have recently been reading a book by a, a wonderful woman named Charlene Lee called The Disruption Mindset. And she's a, I have a podcast called Speakers Who Get Results. Don is a guest on this podcast, but also Charlene Lee is a guest on this podcast about the disruption mindset. And it is a, a business book, but it's a very, a book about how to, um, how to deal with the fact that things change. And we are now, we're recording this during the middle of the shutdown from the COVID-19 pandemic. So as we record this, things are changing around us. And I find that the the wisdom that she offers has a great deal, is very helpful, and is a very um, very thought-provoking book. Wonderful. Thank you for the recommendation. As we come to a close then, any final thoughts that you would like to leave people with today? Oh, I was hoping you would ask me that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The reason it makes sense to polish your public speaking skills is because any presentation where you need to get a result is a sales conversation. So if you think about it, sales is like sex. Nothing happens till somebody gets excited. (laughs) That's a great thought to wrap things up on. Elizabeth, it's been a real pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you so much for coming on the show as a guest. I'm certainly looking forward to coming and appearing on your podcast as well. I'm very excited for that. And uh, I really enjoyed this conversation today. So thank you. Thank you, John. I can't, I can't wait to, to have you. We're going to be recording a couple of days. I can't wait to hear all your wisdom. So wonderful. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please make sure you like and subscribe. There are some great episodes coming up with some amazing guests and I wouldn't want you to miss a single one. If you think you'd be a great guest on the podcast or you know someone who would, I'd love to hear from you. And always, I'm happy to get any feedback that might help to improve the show. As a coach and trainer, I work with service business owners, coaches, trainers, speakers, authors in presentation skills, both online and in person. I help people to create and deliver additional products and services, including webinars that make sales and to add residual income to your business. I teach and train the tools of ethical influence and persuasion that can help you to stand out in the marketplace, to step up as a leader, and to communicate more effectively with clients, customers, and colleagues. If you would like to book in a free 20-minute no-obligation discovery call with me to find out if working with Present Influence is right for you, click the link in the show notes. Alternatively, visit presentinfluence.com, click on the contact page and you will find the link to book in there. I look forward to connecting with you and I look forward to you joining me again on the next episode of the Loki podcast.